giving me the green light. So, good morning, Pleasant View Baptist Church. Let's all stand and turn to page 237, 237 in the red hymnal. We'll sing all three verses. soon season apparently around here so hope you guys are uh, prepared for the rain this coming week it's going to rain every day it looks like so be prepared for that a couple of things by way of announcements next saturday is the fourth of july independence day so celebrate safely with friends and family i'm not sure what the local fireworks displays are this year but uh, some have canceled i've heard just be careful to get out and do that this is coming up weekend also we plan to next sunday morning begin resume classes back in the sunday school rooms if we're comfortable with that, we would merge or we'll, we'll segregate again back to our classes as we normally had been doing. So that'll begin next Sunday morning, Sunday school classes. Well, Bethel Baptist Association's uh, quarterly meeting at Pleasant Valley Baptist Church is going to be at 645 on the 13th of July. So make a note of that if you plan to attend. There's no meal this time, just meeting only at 645. No meal this time at Pleasant Valley Baptist Church. That's July the 13th. And that's the most pressing information I have. Can you guys think of anything else as we get started this morning? Announcements or news? Nothing. Nothing's coming up. Things slow down this time of year. Let's move on then to prayer concerns if we can. If you look in the back of the bulletin, there are some 
prayer concerns, I can update this as we need to. Any prayer concerns should be added or taken off the list there. Uh, pray for our trip, we'll leave on Thursday. So pray for our stand up. I saw on Facebook that Ernie Haas and Singer Snow has canceled all their tour dates because of COVID. So we pray for them. It's been a, uh, you know, kind of a decision for him to make. But, you know, I understand. So it's sure. for the whole year until next year. So pray for all these artists because they're really having a hard time. And Petra's going to do, like, I think one's going to do Izzy with three guys from Petra. So I don't think we're going to do a concert or not. Pray for them because they're, they're doing other stuff right now. So please be safe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, COVID 19 has affected a lot of businesses for sure. Especially entertainment businesses. Oh, yeah. Quite, quite it's been hard. So pray for all of them. Absolutely. Yeah. Got a trip coming up next week, you say? So yeah. keep you in prayer. We'll be back on Tuesday. So we'll be on Thursday. Miss Paula returned safely from North Carolina, right? Yeah. Went gemstone hunting. Got enough gemstones for all of us. But she just won't share. <laughs> <Man>. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a neat trip, but she yeah. described it earlier, just to go hunt these things and they cut them for you and whatever. That's pretty neat. Uh, pray for my parents. They're heading back to Florida today for That's right. traveling mercies, you know, safety. Michelle's folks are in this week and stayed a good half of the week and they're traveling back today, so pray for good travel mercies. That this Sahara sandstorm doesn't affect us too bad over here. Uh, so it's just become mud here, hasn't it? Become sand mud, whatever it is. Pray that washes out of the air that doesn't cause any trouble too. Anything else by way of prayer concerns? Keep remembering Sarah Wicks. I think she is at home. And I think it's probably going to be a long run. Anyone else? How sound? Somebody said they saw an ambulance at her house. I don't know about that. Well, Lois Clayton told me Friday. She said she tried to call you. I didn't know that, no. I don't know whether she's still in there or not, but she had passed out a couple of times. Okay. And they were trying to find out what was wrong with her. We know she's had some heart issues over the years for sure. And, and right, said that she had. nothing they can do about it, so she's going to sooner or later. Gotcha. I will call her and just double check with her, and thank you for the update. Ms. Alma, if you guys didn't hear that, had Amos called her house, was taken to the hospital, maybe she passed out, so. Let's keep Miss Alma in prayer. I spoke with her a week or two back, and she said she wouldn't come back until COVID kind of blew over a little bit and felt like she was safe to come back in the crowd, so she's not getting out until then. So keep her in prayer. Anything else this morning? She went home yesterday. She did go home. Okay, so she's home. But the Paul says she's now home. Let's keep her in prayer. Anything else? If there's not, let you guys stand at this time and go before God in a word of prayer. Pray for Miss Alma. Did go to hospital this week, was discharged according to Brother Paul. She's home now. Keep her in prayer. Keep Miss uh, Sarah Wicks also in prayer. Miss Gina's traveling this week. Keep her in prayer. She goes out of town. Also in prayer for those folks who have been impacted uh, financially by this COVID-19. Keep them in prayer as we pray the business is returned as well. If there's nothing else, we'll open the prayer. Brother David, we'll do some prayer at this time. Father in heaven, we love you and praise you today, Lord. We thank you for the many blessings you have bestowed upon us this week. Lord, we just uh, we ask for prayer for the ones that's in the hospitals and rest homes and ones that are sick. Lord, we ask you to touch them today and let them feel your peace and comfort. We ask you to be with Brother Jared today, Lord, as he brings the message before us that we all stand in need of. We can take it and apply it to our hearts and lives and take it out to the world this week. But most of all, Lord, we, we thank you for allowing your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And you can be seated if you'd like. We're not going to go around a fellowship. But what we can do is wave to your partners across the dance hall if you would. Just say hi to everybody across the sanctuary. There we go. Good wave. Good fellowship. Hi, everyone, this morning. Let's see here. Bert. That's right. Now, it's Paula, you weren't here last week to embarrass you on your birthday, but we're going to embarrass you right now. So, say happy birthday to Miss Paula and Sheila, who's watching remotely. So, Paula and Sheila, happy birthday to those folks. Absolutely. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you.
to tell. How old are you going to be? 61. 61. 61 years young. The youngest mother in the church a couple weeks back. It's a, it's a nice, nice award to get. And uh, Miss Sheila's watching, I hope, remotely. She does watch oftentimes uh, via Facebook, so I hope she's watching. Today. Happy birthday, Miss Sheila. Anything you know, birthday's coming up this week. Can make it to the calendar. There are none. If there are none, then Brother David, children's sermon. Come on down, kiddos. <laughs>
learn about your word. Lord, we ask you to help these children as they plug into you, Lord. Let them pray to talk to you and give them peace and comfort and renew their strength. As the Bible says, you will. We just uh, cannot thank you enough for these children, Lord. They are truly a blessing to us in this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. take up the offering on the way out so if you plan to give like to give uh, do so on your way out at church after the service this morning um, so. i'll lead us in our next hymn which is page 141 in the red hymnal 141 in the red hymnal Sing first, third, and fifth. Hit the, the beginning, the middle, and the end. First, third, and fifth. Steer clear of this pulpit. This thing knocked a hole in my guitar once. So I steer clear of that thing.
how close I need to be to that thing. Well, this is a song I wrote some time back for a friend of mine at work. His uh, wife had left him and took his kids. And he felt like God had forsaken him too, but that ain't the truth. So, here we go. When your life seems dark and dreary And your face is troubled time And you need a friend There is none to find Where the Savior says through thick and thin He will always be your friend Through doubt and uncertainty He is always there He is always there When I need a friend He's always there Through thick and thin Without a doubt Now when you've lost your mind And you've lost your way And you don't think You can make the day So many trouble You can't say Well the Savior says Through thick and thin He will always be And uncertainty He is always there He's always there When I need a friend He's always there To the thick and the thin And the loud and loud Uncertainty He is always Now to stop this pain and this insanity, I give up my pride and my vanity hard. Cause you know I can't make it on my own. So I get down on my knees and pray, ask you, Lord, one more day. No, just what he will say. Well, I am always there. I am always there without a doubt. And certainly, I am that I am. Well, I am. This is going to happen one of these days. Good thing we don't know when. It's a day of coming No place too high. The Lord is searching for and wide. He's looking for those who are going home, leaving those who reject him. Don't wait till tomorrow, cause it might be too late. 
You're not getting old, Mike. You're already old. to judge the living and the dead. It will be too late for many people at some point in the future. We pray even now that those who don't know you would be drawn to you by the Holy Spirit, convicted of their sins, to find salvation full and free before it is too late. Father, this is morning as we open the, the text this morning, 1 Peter 3, we ask that you be with us, that we rightly handle this text, that all we do be pleasing to you to bring you glory. As we transition now from worship and song to worship and word, we ask that you would just be with us this time. Open our eyes, our minds, understand. For it's in Christ that we pray. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Bible's in hand, please turn to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. Perhaps the most mysterious, most difficult passage in the New Testament outside of the book of Revelation to interpret. So if you find yourself with some difficulty... Interpreting this passage, you're in very good company. 1 Peter 3, 18. The text will be on the screen. And to help illuminate the passage, I will go to other clearer passages on down the road. I promise that is at least the plan at this point. 1 Peter 3, 18. The title of the sermon this morning is a question which I hope to answer before we leave today. It is this. Where did Jesus go for those three days after his death? Now, it's easy to say where he is now. The Bible shows that he's at the right hand of the Father. He's ascended to heaven. He is even now in heaven, interceding uh, between God and man. That's where Christ is now. But where was Christ those three days from, from Good Friday, the, from the time he was taken off the cross, until Resurrection Sunday morning? Where was he for that time period from uh, when his body was in the grave? 
I'm going to answer that question in case you didn't know. In case you didn't think there was a question I want to answer, uh, or a mystery, or a, an answer question, I'm going to at least answer this morning. So let me say this. We have to be careful not to go beyond the truth of Scripture, what God has revealed in His Word. But there are mysteries on this side of heaven we can't answer. And maybe, who knows, there's mysteries on the other side of heaven we can't answer even in a glorified body a thousand years from now. Who knows that? But what happened to Jesus those three days from his crucifixion until his ascension to the Father? Did he go to the presence of God? Did he descend to the grave, Sheol or Hades? Did he just lie in that tomb for those three days? Where did Christ go? Where, where was his spirit, the intangible part of Christ, after the crucifixion? Now, I don't want you to think this is just an academic pursuit. This is like the medieval theologians arguing about how many angels can dance in the head of a pen. That it means nothing to you now. But I assure you that how you understand this question, how you answer this question, might affect your view of the atonement. Did Christ pay for sins on the cross, or did he go somewhere else and pay for additional sins? It might affect how you evangelize if there's a gospel chance beyond the grave. Maybe you think where well, this text teaches that. Maybe it views how urgently you preach the gospel. I, I assure you this, this is not an academic question only. This does have practical applications. The Bible is not simply a book of theology. The Bible is not simply a book of theology. It's a story of God's redemptive plan and work among men. Now, within the Bible, we discover the nature of God, his character, or his purpose in creation, and his redemptive plan for mankind. The Bible, of course, is not a book of theology, but it does, of course, contain theology. So to rightly handle this text this morning, I'm really getting us to the point where we're going to read the text in a moment, trust me. We must be careful to interpret the obscure, the muddy, the unclear passages in light of the clearly revealed passages in the Bible. So you get to a passage and say, I don't know what this passage means. Stop. Pump the brakes, slow down, and read a passage that's more clear to help you understand the more difficult passage. It's a simple, simple rule, isn't it? So this morning, just for fun, I'm going to, and this is what I'll do for fun, I'm going to start with a very obscure, difficult passage, and then when I've got you thoroughly confused, I'm going to go to a more clear passage, and you think, ah, oh, that's perfectly what that means. It makes sense now. So without delay, 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20. The text is on the screen if you don't have it in your, in your hands. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and preached and went, proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which he, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Now what happened those three days from Christ, uh, his internment, or his death on the cross, and to the resurrection? And does this text even address those three days? Well, let me start off by saying this. There are three ways to interpret this passage. There are three ways. And so I'm going to present all three very quickly in, in, a, in a quick paragraph. And then I'm going to show you which two I think don't apply and which one makes the most sense and then we'll spend the rest of time in the text. So the first is this. Christ went to preach to the people who died in the Old Covenant, those who were held in Sheol or Hades, which both mean the grave. That Christ, from the time he leaves his body on the cross, his spirit goes away from his body and descends into the grave, the holding place of the deceased Old Testament saints, preaches the gospel. Now, some folks think this makes a lot of sense. This explains a three-day gap that he was gone preaching the gospel to those who hadn't heard the gospel who died in the days of Noah. The antediluvian people, he, they got a chance to hear the gospel beyond the grave. I call this the post-mortem gospel, you know, after his death. That's one theory. Here's another one, number two, that Christ didn't preach anything. He simply, as the text says, proclaimed is the word used here. He proclaims victory over the fallen angels. It's that Christ, not preaching but proclaiming to they, they being the demons, uh, that he was triumphant at last. That's the second, second theory. And this one's gained a lot of popularity in the last few years. And number three, Jesus was preaching in spirit through Noah back when Noah was on the earth preaching righteousness. And you know the story of Noah for 120 years. He preached righteousness, a man of righteousness, preaching men to come, uh, to, cry, to, come to God in repentance. Now let me say this. 
that godly men all throughout church history have held one of these three views. Men that I admire and respect, and I think intellectual giants and men of great, great character. So if you pick one of these three, I'm not going to disparage you for that. In fact, the great German reformer, Martin Luther, who nailed the 95 Thesis to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany, he said this about this passage. A wonderful text this is, and a more obscure passage perhaps than any other New Testament, so that I don't know for certainty what Peter means. I like this. Martin Luther, the great reformer of the church, when he got to 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20, says, I don't know what this means. It's obscure. It's veiled to me. I don't quite get it. But let me say this. Today, we're going to attempt to do what Luther said he couldn't do. We're going to push aside the veil and peek into the text of the scripture and figure out what, what, uh, what Peter means here. And I think we can do this. So not to disparage, again, Luther. I just want to show you that we can do this, I think, with the Bible as a whole. So before I get to the one that I think is true, I'm not going to quiz you on this. There are three. I'm going to show you the two that I don't think is true. They get the one that I think is true and then exegete the passage. So number one is this. One that I don't believe. Number one. The post, this is the post-mortem gospel presentation to Old Testament saints. Now let me stop just for a second. And with, with Mike's song still reverberating in our minds, let me ask this question. Can a man hear the gospel and receive the gospel after he's in the grave? Well, no. Hebrews 9.27, the writer of Hebrews says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. When you've heard the gospel in this life, and have responded in repentance, and have come to Christ for salvation, your death closes that, doesn't it? There's no chance of life or salvation beyond the grave. When you die, your eternal destination has been, has been set, so to speak. You leave this life, there's no hope beyond the grave. But wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice for those who have never heard of Christ or who have rejected the gospel altogether to when they die to be consciously holding someone to take and that Christ descend to them and say, you know what, you didn't believe in your lifetime, but how would you like to believe now? Yeah, yeah right. How many folks would, would, would reject at that point, right? How many folks on seeing Christ, even in that setting, would say, well, I was dead and I'm, a, I'm conscious of Christ. He's preaching the gospel. Well, no. And Brother James is right. People might would like to accept beyond the, beyond the grave, but there's no hope when you die and that casket's closed or when the coroner gives the, the verdict and the autopsy's been completed and the, the time of death's been pronounced, you're done. There's no chance of hope beyond the grave. Hebrews 9.27, men die once. After that judgment, there's no second chance for a man who dies once. So it's urgent that we preach the gospel, the good news of Christ, that men who have, have not heard hear the gospel. Number two is the, the second one I think is becoming more popular, but I don't think it's true either. Number two, that Christ proclaimed victory over fallen angels. And this theory basically says that Jesus was not preaching the gospel, but, but, but uh, proclaiming victory over fallen angels, not for salvation, but to demons is the kind of showing he's triumphant. And I do believe that Christ uh, even now sits triumphant uh, over, over all creation. That Christ is even now seated at his Father's right hand, those enemies be made his footstool. I believe that to be true. I believe that Christ is sitting at the right hand of God the Father. But I don't believe that that's what this passage teaches. In fact, look a closer at this passage. It says, in which, that's he, Jesus, went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they... Formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. Now, if you go back and read Genesis 6, does Noah preach to demons before the flood? No. The they who did not believe refer to those in Noah's generation, doesn't it? The they who did not respond to the call of Noah's preaching refers not to demons or fallen angels, but refers exclusively to the generation of Noah who were unrighteous and were wicked who did not respond. You know, there's no hope for a fallen angel for salvation. You ever thought about that? That those fallen angels, those demons who, fall, who fell from, uh, the, from, from heaven and followed Christ, or, or from, followed Satan rebellion, they have no hope of Christ because Christ didn't die for fallen angels. There's no incarnation of Christ to become an angel, to die for fallen angels, only for fallen men. So now I've my bias. And now you know where I stand. I'm going to spend the rest of the time looking at this passage, I think, in the context in which it was written. First, Christ also suffered once for sins. 
And there's no controversy here. That Christ suffered once on the cross for sins. He died once. He rose once. He's in the Father heaven once. He's going to return. Christ will never die again. Never atone for sins ever again. And the fact that he rose is proof that he had once died. Look at the text a bit further. For, all, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Why did Christ die? As the only righteous man who ever lived, truly righteous, inherently righteous man who ever lived, he dies, of course, for everyone else who are all, by definition, unrighteous. Christ wasn't a martyr for a cause. He was a sacrifice for sin. Christ literally dies in the place of sinful men. Look at the next verse. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. You know, the purpose, the primary purpose of Christ's incarnation, why he became flesh, why he condescended to become man, why he was born in the, uh, and laid in the cattle trough in Bethlehem, why Christ became an infant and a toddler and grew to adulthood. You know, the primary purpose that Christ became man was so God could die. Because God, who is spirit, cannot die. You can't put God, who is in spirit, on the cross. He must become flesh to die for sinful men. Listen carefully this morning. Jesus did not die that we might live. He died that we might die. He rose from the grave, rose from the dead that we might live. The gospel is not just that Christ died, but he also rose from the dead. You got that? Christ died as you would die in your place, dying for you. But not that you would live but that you would die to your sins, be crucified with Christ. No longer I live, but Christ in me lives. Christ then rose from the dead, not that we would die, but that we would live. We take part in Christ's sacrifices. We're nailed to the cross in our sins, and then we raise from, from the dead as Christ was risen, that we can have a glorified, <coughs> resurrected body. Let's continue. It gets tricky now. Made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and pro proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Now it's about to get sideways. It's about to get really sticky right now, but bear with me. I'm going to keep you guys on path the best that I can. What is meant by prison here? Is this the prison the departed souls or this, with the departed saints the old covenant went and kind of hung out for a while? Is this a place where departed demons go held in chains? Is this uh, prison the Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport of the afterlife? Where you just kind of get held over to the next flight comes in to get the next plane to fly out? A holding place? No. Notice the text here says, uh, says prison, that he went to the prison. Didn't say the grave, Hades. Doesn't say hell, Gehenna. He went to the prison. Yeah. Now people say, well, the Bible says in Revelation in Jude that demonic angels are held in prisons, and that's true, waiting for the judgment of God. But they weren't preached in the days of Noah. There's another use of the word prison in the New Testament that describes not fallen angels, but fallen men. Did you know that before you met Christ as Savior, you were bound in shackles to sin? You were under the weight of God's law. You were under the curse of God's law, and you were shackled by, the own, by your own sin? Listen carefully. You are either slaves to yourself or you're slaves to Christ. Look in Luke chapter 4. This is Jesus' first public ministry. It's, if, you, if you read this entire chapter sometime, you'll notice that, that he gets kicked out of his hometown after he preaches his first sermon. Uh, talk about a chilly reception. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And he, Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. This is the home of Joseph and Mary. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. Verse 17. I didn't notice this detail to this week, and I've read this a thousand times. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, but look at this. He unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written. Now, he selects the text himself from Isaiah. Verse 18. And here's what he selected. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to proclaim the good news to the, to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's his text. And here's his sermon. And he rolls up the scroll 
and gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And all the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say them, to them, Today, this sermon has been fulfilled in your hearing. And that is the sermon. Today, the scripture fulfilled in your hearing. You got the text, and you got the sermon. And to drop the mic, walk out of the room, cut the lights off, that is it. What is Christ saying his, his, his uh, core verse of his ministry is going to be? What is Christ's foundational text for his entire ministry is this. He's come to liberate men who find themselves in the shackles of sin, waiting to the very heavy stone of death, cast into the abyss. Christ has come to liberate men from the, from the chains of sin and the penalty therein. Christ has come to liberate men from, from the penalty of death. Now, the call to repent and turn toward Christ in obedience was the call of Noah. It was the call of prophets. It was the call of the apostles. It was the message also of Christ. Look at the text again. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. To, he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. The gospel is liberating. It sets men free from bondage. It removes the shackles of sin. It frees men from the penalty of death. And that's what Noah preached to his unrepentant generation. The prophets preached, the apostles preached, and Christ himself preached. But I assure you this passage in 1 Peter 3 has nothing to do with preaching the fallen angels, nothing to do with preaching the folks who passed away in a holding tank somewhere. But it does have an important application for us. Now, you say, well, Jared, I'm not convinced just yet. I like. Do you not fear God since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And indeed, justly, for we are receiving due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. Two men nailed side by side to Christ so close if their hands were loosened they could reach out and touch Christ's dying flesh. Reach out. One scorns him. One shames him. Get us off the cross, he says. You're not the Christ. And the other, in a moment of clarity, says, he's the Christ. We deserve to be on crosses. We deserve to die. But he does not. He's done nothing wrong. A moment of clarity from God. And he says to Jesus, simply remember me when you come into your kingdom. In verse 43, and Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today you'll be with me in paradise. The thief was to be with Christ on that day in paradise. The moment that he left this life, he was with Christ in paradise. The oldest written word in the world is a Persian world, and it's paradiso, which is paradise, which means garden. The oldest Written word in the world is garden. I love that. And if you love to garden, you know that there's nothing closer to God than growing a plant, seeing how fast it grows and producing something that it doesn't owe you anything, but it gives you its fruit. Paradise, the oldest written word in the world. Jesus promises this thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. They would be in paradise in the presence of God that very moment of time. Look in uh, Verse 44 and following. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness all over the whole, earth, whole land until the ninth hour. Verse 45. When the sun's light failed, and while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Immediately upon his death, Christ enters the presence of God. No detour to Sheol. No layover at Dallas-Fort Worth International layover in the afterlife. Christ left this life with the presence of the Father. He walked arm in arm in the presence of God with this thief that very hour. The Bible says they formerly did not know, did not obey when God patience waited in the days of Noah. While the ark was being prepared, few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through water. God was patient during the days of Noah. Noah was patient 
during the days of Noah. Noah preached 120 years and had eight converts, including himself. Can you imagine that? Talk about an unsuccessful ministry. 120 years preaching the message of repentance and only eight people, including yourself, believe? 120 years preaching the same message. It's going to rain. The wrath of God is coming. Repent. Get in the boat. You'll be saved. You see, the Bible says that Noah preached rain when there was no rain. Then one day, the Bible says God shut the door to the ark. And then one day, those outside screamed, let me in. But it was too late. Imagine if, if you found that ark of Noah somewhere. There'd be nail scratches on the outside of that. As many clawed to get on that boat as the water began to lift it up. And all the high places began to be submerged from the falling rain. The water rushing down canyons and valleys. Submerging everything. Washing everything out to sea. Creating seas where there were none. Repent. Turn to God. Trust in Him. Get in the boat. And then it rained. And one day it began to rain and didn't stop for 40 days and 40 nights. Covered, covered the earth. And all but eight souls perished in that flood. And we stand outside and say, God is raining now. And one day his wrath will come to men who don't believe. One day God will visit the earth in a very real, tangible way. And all who don't believe will be washed away, not by water, but by fire. And those who don't believe will perish on this earth. Oh, that's, that's never happened before. It can't happen now. Listen carefully. The ark, as we close this out, the ark is a type of Christ. It was a shelter from the wrath of God. This wooden structure, which saved eight souls, points us to another wooden structure. Not a boat, but a cross on which Christ was nailed. You know Christ the Bible? Have you bowed your knee and heart to him? If not, come today. Let us pray. Our fathers, we bow before this morning. As we close this part of the service out, remind us the urgency of the gospel, the urgency of believing before it's too late, the urgency of repenting, accepting Christ on his terms. Our fathers, we transition now from the preaching of your word now to the invitation. Remind us that you've invited us at this time to come. As you, through the days of Noah, Invited men to come even then. Through the heart cry of the prophets for men to repent and turn, you invited them as well. The preaching of Christ the Apostle, you also even now preach to us through your written word. That we would come today, find salvation. For it's in Christ that we pray. Everyone says, Amen. Amen. Please stand at this time. Page. 308 in the blue handle. 308. Come every soul, I sing in a breast, there's mercy with no more. Every tear will surely give you rest, I trust in Tune in this evening. Uh, 
be on Facebook Live. We'll be on actually the YouTube link, so if you check that out, Evening Services. Not very long, we, we posted in a moment or two here. Uh, if there's nothing else, we'll close out in prayer. Be careful out there. Close us out. Precious Heavenly Father, we just love you so much. We praise your name and thank you for just the time to be in your house today, Lord. Just pray, uh, thank you, Lord, for the word that was given, Lord. I just pray that we would meditate on it, Lord, and that we would just apply that to our lives. I pray that you watch over us as we depart our separate ways. You keep us safe, Lord. 